Good morning and welcome to our service today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. What a wonderful day to come together and celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Lord, the day on which we are given new life and new hope, not only for today, but for eternity. Would you please stand as we sing together, Resurrection Day. like to come out to the front we're going to have our kids talk good morning Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. my name's Hannah and welcome to church this morning especially if you're one of the children here. Now, we're going to be retelling the Easter story this morning. So if there's any other children who haven't come down yet who would actually like to come down, please come down. Now, I just said something to the whole church. Did you hear what I said? I said Christ is risen. Okay, what does it mean Christ is risen? Because that word's going to be important in our story. Risen from the dead, what does that mean? Did he just, like, hover in the air? No? What was it? He undeadified. <laughs> Thank you, Micah, yeah. Death wasn't anymore. He's alive. That's so when we tell this story, when you hear risen, it doesn't just mean kind of standing up. It means alive. Okay, this story that we're going to tell is called The Empty Tomb. Crazy. And we're going to stick it here because this part here is going to remind us of where the tomb was. We're going to have a few different people in this story. We need people to be the women who come to the tomb. We need two guards who are guarding the tomb. We need one lightning angel. Raphael's got the lightning angel already, I'm sorry. 
maybe, and we need some people to be an earthquake? Thought so. And then at the end, there'll be one last person who I'll be, but the women, the people being the women, will need to keep talking to that person. I wonder if you can guess who that will be at the end of this story. Okay, so the story starts like this. I am, and I'm narrating it from the book of Matthew in the Bible, which is one of the stories about Jesus. So if all the people who would like to be the women would stand up and walk over with me, and all the people who want to be the earthquake, if you would come and sit here, who's going to be an earthquake? Yeah, okay, you sit here, Ishka. So you're going to sit on that bit because you're going to need to drum here as an earthquake. Other people are going to join in with Ishka, I can tell. Uh, Micah is going to be a guard, so can you stand here? You can be a guard, stand on the other side. Raf, can you move a bit further over? Guards, standing up, nice and strong, like you've got a spear and a sword and a helmet. Stand up, you can't be a guard sit, crouching down. Now, and the women over here with me. Here we go. Come on, women! Thank you very much. Okay, the rest of you can listen to the story. This is what happened. When Jesus died on the cross, there were many women who were watching. They were watching him die and they saw him die and they were women who loved him, who'd been following him. And they were so sad. Their hearts were broken. The man that they had loved and followed had died. Some of the women who were there was Mary Magdalene and another Mary as well and some of the other women they watched Jesus be taken down from the cross and taken to the tomb and wrapped up in white cloths and the tomb sealed with a giant rock he was dead but listen to what happened now After the Sabbath, at dawn on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Come on, women. There was a violent earthquake. Rumble, 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 come on. And the stone, uh, sorry, uh, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Just put the lightning on. And keep rumbling, come on. And angel of the Lord came down from heaven. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid they shook and they fainted. Come on, women. The angel said to the women... We are so afraid. Do not, Go for it. Yep. Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to in, into Galilee. There you will see him. So the women, they hurried away from the tomb, afraid, because they'd just seen an angel. Come on, women, they hurried. Do you remember where we're going? Where were they going? To tell the disciples. What were they going to tell? That he was risen. The tomb was empty. There was only clothes in there, no body. Let's go. And they ran this way. Come on, women. Mary, women. They were filled with joy because Jesus wasn't in the tomb. And suddenly, Jesus met them. I'm going to stand in for Jesus at the moment. He said, shalom, peace to you. And they came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there you will see me. Pardon? It was called 
Galilee. Yeah, fantastic. Well, sitting down. Big round of applause for all the people playing. You can come and sit down now. Come and sit down. Now, this was such good news. Do you remember how the women were feeling at the beginning? So sad because Jesus had died and they came to the tomb expecting a rock in front with dead Jesus inside, but they wanted to come anywhere. But what happened instead? Yeah, so this is the part where he's still on earth. You're right, later he goes to be with his father. But the power that came was like lightning and Jesus was alive. So we're going to sing a song now to help us remember to celebrate that Jesus is alive. Just hang on a second. It's called, what is it called? Someone tell me. He is risen. Thank you. And there's that word. There's that word again. So the chorus of the song goes, he is risen, hallelujah, hallelujah, he is risen, hallelujah. And that's the bit where you're going to join in and sing. So who wants a streamer? Yeah. Woo. Okay. Everyone can join in the song because the words are on the screen. I'll give you half. This is for waving, hallelujah. Just find the bit and hold on to the top and then you can wave it. Yeah, they're little, but they're fun. Good. Okay, I reckon we can start that song. Everyone standing up, ready to wave, hallelujah. It is like a jellyfish. Woo! It's more down there, on it? Oh no, that's Micah's. The amazing. Okay, kids, uh, you, there are some uh, colouring in things and some pencils and things you can get from Jimmy. Grab those and head back to your family. And we will take a seat as uh, we pray together of the risen Lord Jesus. 
Let's pray. Glorious Lord of life, by the mighty resurrection of your Son, you overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him. Grant that we who celebrate with joy Christ's rising from the dead may be raised from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we believe that Jesus did die and he did rise again, and that is something that happened in history, but we also believe that it has a profound impact on lives today, right now. And we believe that because we've seen it again and again and again. And so we're going to hear a story of someone for whom the resurrection has changed and impacted their lives now. And so I invite Joseph to come forward. Good morning, everyone. I was born into a Christian family in South India, so I've attended church from my childhood days. First, I'll share my thoughts on what Good Friday and Easter meant to me before I accepted Jesus and how it has changed over the years. To begin with, what we call Good Friday in English is called Dukkha in our native language, which means a sorrowful day. And it was a sad day indeed. The priest and the choir wore special black robes for Good Friday. The Good Friday service will last more than three hours with sermons on every statement Jesus made at the cross. For me, rather than focusing on the message, it was more about counting how many were left before we, <laughs> we could get home and have lunch. And the lunch was not very exciting either because we would still be fasting and usually it would be rice porridge with lentils. On the contrary, Easter was a happy occasion, just like we had today. Everyone is smiling and everyone was smiling that day and wishing each other. And we sang happy songs like Christ, Jesus Christ is risen today. And after Easter, life will go back normal. I always had questions though. Why should Jesus die for me? I did not lead a good life compared to my siblings and many others. So Jesus dying for me, a sinner like me, was out of question. Jesus might have died for the priests, my parents, and for many good people. So I aspire to be one of them in future. When I'm old, probably on my deathbed, after enjoying all my life. It was the book of Romans and our family circumstances after we arrived in Australia that changed everything. Verses like, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans chapter 3. And when Apostle Paul says in chapter 7, verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. So I understood I had company. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with sin. I started to understand what Jesus said at the cross when he said, it is finished. My sins are being taken care of, so I don't have to worry about my past. But what about the future? What kind of life should I lead to ensure God's will for me? What does the resurrected Jesus want me to do? I found answers in the Bible. Everything we need for our salvation is in the Bible. There were ups and downs in my faith life, 
Many times I lost the first life I had for Jesus. But God never gave up on me. As he promises, he will never leave us for forsake. To conclude, the resurrected Jesus wants me to love everyone more than I love myself. He wants me to seek the kingdom first and not worry about everything else. While Satan will ensure that we have enough and more troubles that we don't have time to seek the kingdom first. I reduce my shifts for my second job to study the word of God, which I did to pay my monthly repayments for mortgage. And I still don't struggle anymore. God gave me heavenly wisdom to complete my master's despite my two jobs. It was really a miracle. Resurrected Jesus also assures me that because he lives, I will also live even if I die. Resurrected Jesus encourages me to do everything according to his will and all for his glory. Finally, the resurrected Jesus wants me to prepare and be ready for his second coming and help others to be ready. May God help us all to do his will on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, Joseph has just talked about how powerful God's word has been in his life and how transformative that's been. And that's one of the reasons why every single Sunday we turn to God's word in the Bible and hear it. And uh, again and again, we see people changed and transformed by it. So I'm going to pray for us as we turn to the Bible now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who does not remain silent, but that you speak to us and you've spoken your word into this world and that you are still at work through it. Uh, Father, as we hear uh, your word and as we hear the words of those who saw the risen Jesus on that day almost 2,000 years ago, would you be at work by your Holy Spirit and make those words alive in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have our first reading from the book of Isaiah. Thank you, Sarah. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 26. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruit, then at his coming, 
those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is this, for the word of the Lord. Well, the Christian hope, uh, the Christian proclamation is that Jesus is indeed alive. And if he's alive, then he's alive today. And he is king and lord of all. Would you please stand as we sing, Majesty. reading is taken from Mark chapter 28 verses 1 to 15. Glory to you, Lord After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was drawing, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb and suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he was being raised, as he said. 
Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, They must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still told among the Jews to this day. For this is the gospel of the Lord. Well, please take a seat, everyone. Christ is risen. My name is Jimmy Young, and it's my great pleasure to preach to you this Easter Sunday. And my question for you is this, what do you actually believe about the resurrection? What do you believe about Jesus rising from the dead? I must confess to you that I've entered into a strange season of life. Uh, One of the things I've started to notice is that a number of my friends have got heavily into conspiracy theories. I don't know if this is something about hitting your 30s, about something about after lockdown, but they've got really into conspiracy theories and have started to share a number of them with me. And they range from garden variety conspiracy theories, like the moon landing was fake, the earth is flat, 5G, all this kind of stuff. But my personal favorite conspiracy theory is that birds aren't real. If we get a picture on the screen... Birds are surveillance devices given to us by the government to report back on your everyday life. Cameras, microphones, batteries, everything you need to know. And they share this with me and I start to ask lots of questions, but it's hard to argue with conspiracy. And the reason that I'm sharing with this with you on Easter Sunday is because the first Easter Sunday ends in conspiracy. It ends with a plot. It ends with people planning to cover up what is actually happening. You see, on the first Easter, they had plans. They knew what to do. Jesus had died on the cross. They put him in the tomb, and they had plans to make sure that this was a secure place that no one could break in. Let's see if the text's going to work for me today. Here we go. That's not the right one. It's not, it's not working for me today. That's okay. Let's see if the next slide is there. None of the slides are there. There was none there this morning either. That's okay. Can we just go to a blank screen? Let me read out for us. This is what the authorities said in Matthew 27. Command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people, he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. This is the brief that they've been given. Make it as secure as you possibly can. As many things as you need to do. But what do we know? Jesus has died on the cross. He's been placed in the tomb, and three days later, The tomb is empty. The guards are bamboozled. They come to the authorities saying something has happened. And what do the authorities do? But they cover up. Reading from verse 11. The guards went into the city, told the chief priests everything that had happened. And after the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them they must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. 
So they took the money and did as they were directed to do. They cover up, they scheme, they plot, they plan because they know what everyone who thinks about the resurrection long enough knows is that if the resurrection is true, it changes everything. If the resurrection is true, if Jesus actually physically, bodily rose from the dead, it changes everything. Everything he said is true. Everything he claimed is true. He really is the Son of God. Peter Hitchens, who is the Christian brother of famous and noted atheist Christopher Hitchens, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so noted in the New Atheists, was once asked at the 2013 Festival of Dangerous Ideas, what is the most dangerous idea that you know? And he said, well, that's easy. The most dangerous idea I know about is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And when pushed, he said, well, it changes everything. It changes reality. It changes who we serve. It changes the order of the universe. It changes who's in charge. It changes every single aspect of our life if you allow it to. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead changes everything. And so what do you actually think about the resurrection? What do you believe? On Easter Sunday, we're always a mix of people. There are some who are convinced, some who have questions. Some who have doubts, some who are determined that this is the one. So what do you actually believe about Jesus? Because I think... What we need to explore are three different things. We need to know that the resurrection is true or not. We need to know whether it has any consequences because just because something's true doesn't mean it changes everything. And we need to know whether it actually changes our life. And so I want to spend some time looking at, is this true? Does it mean anything? And will it actually change our life? I think there are at least four different facts that Anyone, Christian, non-Christian, avowed atheist, or attend every Sunday, has to agree are true about the resurrection of Jesus. The first is simply that Jesus Christ was actually crucified on the cross. There is no New Testament historian, Christian or unchristian, who doesn't believe that this actually took place. John Dixon, who's a Christian apologist, once put out a challenge that if someone could find a tenured professor of history who doesn't believe that Jesus was actually crucified, he would eat his hat. Well, his hat has gone uneaten. There can't be one found. There is no tenured professor of history that doesn't believe that Jesus was really crucified on the cross. The second fact that everyone agrees on is that three days later, the tomb was apparently empty. The reasons why are discussed, but what generally is agreed upon is that, at least in the four Gospels, the way things go is that, one, the tomb is empty, and that at every single turn, women are the first people on the scene. And that makes a significant difference. Why? Because it's strange. The general theory goes out there in the world is that the disciples must have stolen the body or come up with a story. But the challenge is that if they came up with a story, they would have simply come up with a better story. When historians are generally trying to work out whether something is true or false, one of the criterions they include is called the criterion of embarrassment. That if you make up a story, you're not likely to make up a story that is embarrassing for you. We generally make up stories that make us look good, that make us look powerful, important, that seem persuasive. Why would this be embarrassing? It's not embarrassing for the church or for Christians, but in first century Israel, the the testimony of women was not believed. It was not legally binding in court. In fact, first century and second century critics of Christianity often use this as a tool, saying, how could you believe that someone rose from the dead where the only testimony you have is from the women? This was the claim of Celsus, a second century critic. Simply put, if the church was going to come up with a story, they'd come up with a more persuasive story that include different people, people whose testimony could be believed. Yet at every turn, the first people at the empty tomb are women, most likely because that's what happened. So Jesus has been crucified. The tomb is empty, and immediately afterwards, the church starts seeing 
visions of Jesus, experiences of Jesus, where they claim to see Jesus actually physically, bodily resurrected from the dead. Historian Gert Ludemann, who uh, is not a Christian, in fact, we might have his quote on the screen on the next slide, said, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Now, he would say they were just experiences, but the church claimed this universally, that they saw Jesus after his death, after the tomb had been closed. And this evidence was strong enough that people who weren't Christians, people who weren't his followers, people like the Apostle Paul, who was killing Christians around this time, or people like Jesus' brother, James, changed their minds and came to know him as the risen Lord. Do you know how much evidence my brother would need to believe that I had risen from the dead? He would need a lot. He knows me. But they had experiences so powerful that changed their minds. And the fourth fact, which no one could deny, is that immediately after they claim to see Jesus raised from the dead, the church explodes in numbers. Which strikes me as odd, because at the time of Jesus' death, this is a discouraged, defeated group whose most recent claim to fame is denying Jesus three times and running away naked from Roman soldiers. This is not who you'd choose as your missionaries. This is not who you'd choose to be the bold and courageous number, but something happens. Something happens that turns this ragtag, defeated group of cowards into a bold, powerful, persuasive missionary force, and immediately the church explodes in numbers. I don't know about you, but they don't seem to gain very much. You wonder, if it's not actually truth, what's their motive? Because they don't get any more money, they don't get any more fame, they lose relationships, they lose their status, they lose their reputation, they lose, in many cases, their family, and for most of them, they lose their life. My guess is that most of, many people maybe, maybe not most of us, but many people would die for something they actually believe was true. But who's going to believe, who's going to die for something they know is a lie? Who's going to die for something not only that they know is a lie, but something they made up as a lie? You're just not going to do that. You're not going to give up money and fame and wealth and family and inheritance and reputation and your life for something you know is a lie. It's not worth it. N.T. Wright, uh, who's a former bishop in England, said that the, the only thing that early Christians gained in the first three centuries of Christianity was opposition, persecution, torture, and death. There's no motive for the explosion in numbers. And so you start to ask yourself the question, what's the story that best fits these facts? What's the evidence that best points to the conclusion? And the the most likely, the most logical for me is that Jesus actually physically, bodily rose from the dead. It explains the empty tomb. It explains the experiences the apostles had. It explains the church's number in growth. Their willingness to die is that they actually saw Jesus raised from the dead. It's true. It's true. But just because something is true doesn't mean it will change your life. We know a number of different true things that we know is information, but it won't change your life. It doesn't change your life that butterflies eat with their feet. That's true. Not going to change your life. But what the church has always believed is that believing in the resurrection has consequences. The resurrection of Jesus is not just a true thing that's happened. It's a true thing that has changed history universally, but also for us. The resurrection has consequences. The resurrection of Jesus changes things. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, it changes everything. The resurrection of Jesus declares that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King. If death can't hold him, there is nothing he is subservient to. There is no power on earth that he is under. He is the King. If the resurrection of Jesus actually happened, it declares that God cares deeply, profoundly about justice. Because the last word on Good Friday is that Jesus deserved to die. 
That's the declaration. This is a man who deserves to die. And yet by Easter Sunday, God's justice has returned. Changed the fact the lie has been replaced with the truth. God's justice has replaced the injustice. The resurrection declares that God's justice will occur. The resurrection of Jesus declares that God's plan for history will remain supreme. There's lots of talk in our culture about being on the right side of history when it comes to a number of different issues. And to be honest, I don't know. I, I'm just not smart enough to know what the right side of history will be in 20, 30, 50 years. I don't know what history will do. All I know is that I want to be on God's side of history. Whatever he says, wherever he goes, that's the kind of history that I want to be a part of because God's plan will not fail. If death cannot defeat it, what can? The resurrection of Jesus declares that Jesus is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, and is praying for his people, that Jesus definitively cares for us. And not just us, that Jesus cares for you individually. He's praying for you, interceding for you. He cares for you. The resurrection of Jesus declares that he's coming back. That there will come a time where justice will reign, where Jesus will restore all injustices and put them to right, and he will come to judge. The resurrection of Jesus declares that Jesus has eternal life to give. That if he has defeated death, that whatever he has, he can share, and he can share eternal life with us. Anyone who believes in him will have eternal life and will not perish, will spend life with God, life with Jesus, life as part of God's family forever. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. So what do you actually think about the resurrection? What do you actually believe about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus? Because it kind of all boils down to what you actually think about Easter Sunday, doesn't it? what you actually think about what's reported. If we go to the next slide. Again, the passage didn't update. That's okay. I'm going to read it. What do you think about verses 5 to 8? The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. What do you think about that? In your heart of hearts, what do you believe about the resurrection? Here's my question for you, my challenge. Because I know there are a lot of people in this room who have questions and doubts, who are not sure, who are sure enough to come on Easter Sunday, but not sure. Not entirely bought in. Here's my question. If you entered the church this morning uncertain about whether Jesus literally, physically, bodily rose from the dead, what evidence would you need to convince you otherwise? What evidence would you need? To see him. Sure. I talk to a number of different people and they say, nothing. Nothing. But if we're being honest, if we say nothing would convince me, we're not being serious. My friends who are into conspiracies, that's what they say. I found the truth. I've done the research. Nothing would convince me. I say you're not being serious. You need to wrestle with what actually happens. So here's my challenge. If you have doubts and questions, if you're not sure, if you have things in your head, you're like, I've got to work this out, it is imperative on you to work out what you actually think. It's not enough that mom or dad believes. What do you think? It's not enough that your friends have brought you to church. What do you actually believe? It's not enough that you attend church every Sunday. What do you actually believe about the resurrection of Jesus? And what are you going to do about it to find out? Because there are so many different ways that you can start to wrestle with this. Why not come to church next Sunday? Spend time with people who have worked this out, wrestle with it, and come to the conclusion that he rose from the dead. Ask them, why do you believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead? Why not come to an Alpha 
Alpha is simply a group of people who are not sure about the resurrection and want to find out. It's a group of people who have questions about Christianity and want to find out more. We have one starting in a couple of weeks. Why not join? Find out whether this is true or not. Why not join a Bible study? Open up the Bible. Find out what it says. Because if it's not true, then you've got an Easter Sunday free for the rest of your life. If it's not true, you don't have to worry about this at all. But if it is true, it is changes everything. It changes who is king. It changes who is in control. It changes where justice comes from. It changes what happens to us. It changes eternity. So what are you going to do about that if you're not sure? And if you are sure, what are you going to do about your conviction that this is true in telling other people? Because if you believe it's true, it changes everything for you as well. I'm going to pray for us now. And I pray, what I'm going to pray is that Jesus would come to meet with us in the same way that he came to meet with Paul, in the same way that he came to meet with Peter and the disciples, that Jesus would come to be with us in our hearts. Let me pray. God, we pray right now that regardless of where we have come from, whether we have questions or certainty, Whether we have doubts or we are determined that we know. God, would you be with us? Would you speak to us? We thank you for speaking to us from your word. We thank you that your word is true, that you did rise from the dead, that it has consequences for our life. It changes everything. But just like Jesus who once was dead but now is alive, that is the future for all who believe in him. So God... Would you draw more and more people to yourself? Would you reveal yourself to those who have questions? Would you encourage those who are certain to have more and more boldness? Lord, the resurrection changes everything. Let it change us from the inside out, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one of the things that the resurrection of Jesus changes is that as he sits at the right hand of God in power, he enables us to come into the very presence of God, the Father himself, and speak with him uh, heart to heart. We're going to do that right now as Julie leads us in prayer. This morning with our prayers... When I say, Jesus, Lord of life, could you please respond with, in your mercy, hear us. In joy and hope, let us pray. We know that our Redeemer lives and we worship you, Lord Jesus Christ, the immortal one who died and rose for all sin and for all sinners in every time and place. Equip us with the power that raised Christ from the dead to serve you today and all the days ahead. Jesus, Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. We pray that our risen Saviour may fill us with the joy of his glorious and life-giving resurrection. We pray for the isolated and persecuted churches that they might find strength in the good news of Easter. We ask that God may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love, that he may provide for those who lack food, work or shelter, and that by his power, war and famine may cease through all the world. Jesus, Lord of life, In your mercy, hear us. Jesus, our way, our truth, our life, be with us and all who follow you in the way. Deepen our appreciation for your truth and fill us with your life. Jesus, Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. Jesus, good shepherd, 
who gave your life for the sheep. Recover the straggler, bind up the injured, strengthen the sick, and lead the healthy and strong to new pastures. Jesus, Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. Heavenly Father, you have delivered us from the powers of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. We give you thanks for all who have lived and believed in you. Grant that as his death has recalled us to life, so his continual presence in us may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, Jimmy said that uh, the resurrection is not just a fact like other facts, like a butterfly eating through its feet, although that is a remarkable fact, which I didn't know before today, so thank you. But it's a, a fact of history that actually changes people's lives. And one person whose life it has changed is Samuel. Samuel wrote it. I'm going to invite him. In fact, I am inviting him right now to come and share his story with us. Thank you for giving me this chance to share my history. As I grew up, I grew up in a Christian family and uh, until the age, until 2005, that is when I invited Jesus Christ into my life. And because of his grace and mercy, uh, he has continued to guide me in, in this journey of faith. Because of this man's love, I chose to share this to others and to my family about this goodness of Christ. And how to celebrate the Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Whatever Christ went through in the cross, there's nothing that is comparable in life and sometimes as Christians we go through some situations and I particularly us and even me and there's nothing that is comparable for that to what Jesus Christ went through and it's compelled me to keep on soldiering on and trusting in him in whatever circumstance that comes in life and as an East ambassador um, I have continued to live a life that is humiliates him in whatever that I do in each and every day life and impacting on those that I serve in each and daily basis. And as we, uh, as I, uh, share this uh, testimony. When we came to this country, I remember very well that I knew Christ was with me in every time, in every situation. And to share how his grace and goodness, there's a time that we went for a rental uh, inspection and we had so many people. And by all standards, we didn't have a rental history, we didn't have a job, we didn't have, and we knew no one. 
And there were so many people in that time. And as we did the inspection and we went by, but because we had faith for the Christ that we served, we said, if it's your will that this is going to happen, so be it. And I don't know how it happened, but I think it's by God's grace. Among us all the people who had by all standards, by human standard, they had what it takes to have the house. We were freely and given to us. And it has continued to encourage us on each and every time. And there are so many other testimonies that the love of Christ has been portrayed in us and in our lives. And as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, it gives, us that, gives me that hope of eternal life. And it took somebody to share that word to me. And it's compelled me to share it to other people. For those, that even those who have not heard the word, leave alone those of us who hear the word on each day, but we haven't accepted this word. And in, in so doing, I dedicated my life to working with the missions in a remote area of South Sudan. And uh, as we celebrate the Easter today, they had a number of them being baptized. So we, uh, yeah, we thank God for that. And as we continue to, to reflect on his goodness, in our lives. Let us not grow weary in whatever circumstance that we are in because he paid it all in the cross. He has risen and he has that hope of eternity for all of us, for those who trust. My prayer is um, let's continue keeping, keeping on as in the book of Philippians 3 13 to 14 I'm not sure that as Peter said, as John said, let's continue fixing our eyes uh, on Jesus. Thank you very much. Well, we've been saying that uh, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And if you would like to take a step today, and step into that new life. There's a very simple way that people have done down through the ages. And in fact, uh, we do every single Sunday ourselves as we refresh ourselves in the new life that's in Christ. We come to God and we say sorry. We say sorry for the ways in which we have not lived for him. We say sorry for the ways in which we haven't loved our neighbours as ourselves. Christians aren't perfect. Uh, we're forgiven and we're forgiven in Christ the risen Lord and so we're going to say a confession now even though it's a joyful and wonderful day this is in fact a joyful and wonderful thing that we can bring not only the nice parts of us but all of us to God and ask for him to change us and to renew us if you would like that in your life please do join with us as we pray this prayer of confession today and so, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, Strengthen us in the love and newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is slow to anger and he is full of compassion, forgiving all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. God therefore forgives you today, this morning, in Christ Jesus, who is our risen Lord, in whom there is no condemnation. 
Amen. Well, because we have peace with God, we can have peace with each other. Would you please stand? We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you turn to one another and say, peace be with you. Well, as we uh, make our way back to our seats and as the musicians come forward, we're going to be singing again. It was finished on that cross. The curse has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me. Full the pardon he has offered. Great the welcome that I received. Death was once my great opponent. Fear once held a hold on me. But the son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Let's sing.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts. Use them to the increase of your kingdom for the glory of your name. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks that you raised him to life triumphant and exalted him in glory. By his victory over death, the reign of sin is ended. The new day has dawned. A broken world is restored. And we are made whole once more. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, gracious God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who receive them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, according to our Saviour's word, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may share his body and blood. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread and when he'd given you thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We eat this bread and we drink this cup to proclaim the death of the Lord. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus. Father, as we recall his saving death and glorious resurrection, May we who share these gifts be renewed by your Holy Spirit and united in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, there to feast at your table and join in your eternal praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite the communion assistants to come forward. A communion is something for those who truly believe that Jesus has risen from the dead and who is living for him as Lord. If you're visiting from another church or you're a believer, you're very welcome to take uh, part in the bread and the wine together with us. If you are still investigating uh, that or you're here uh, because a friend or family member has invited you. We're so glad that you came and said yes to that invitation. And perhaps this is a time for you to consider uh, the evidence that you've heard of the resurrection of Christ and what the next steps might be for you. Well, brothers and sisters, draw near with faith and feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving.
eternal God, giver of life. In the breaking of the bread, we know the risen Lord. May we who celebrate this holy feast walk in his risen light and bring new life to all creation. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome to you if it is uh, among your first times here at St. John's. And if that's the case, we'd love to get to know you better. You'll find a little contact card somewhere within reach at your pews. There's a number of things you can do with this contact card. One is you can scan the QR code on the front there and that will take you to a page where it will be A, B and C. A is for Alpha. Um, Jimmy mentioned during his sermon that's an introduction to Christianity. If you want to investigate more, you can sign up to Alpha. It starts on the 15th of April, 7pm. There's a meal. Uh, there is uh, some input about some of the basics of Christianity. And then there's an opportunity to ask questions questions and discuss and be as sceptical as you like and push as hard as you like uh, in a safe and relaxed kind of an environment. Uh, so you can sign up to that uh, just by uh, scanning the QR code. It will take you to a page where you can do that. Uh, B is for belong. You can let us know more of your details and we'll get in contact with you and let you know more about the church if you would like to do that. And see us contribute. You can contribute uh, either online to the work of the church uh, or you can contribute time and there's lots of ways in which you can serve at the church. Uh, if you can't do that on your phone, that's what the back of the card's for. Uh, fill it in and pop it into the box over there. But I'd really encourage you to particularly think about Alpha and investigating more. For our regulars, just to let you know, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be away on leave. And so if you've got any pastoral emergencies or things, Jimmy's the man to see and he'll look after you uh, exceptionally well. Jimmy, come on up. I've got an announcement for all the kids. Who loves Easter egg hunts? Oh, there were lots of hands that went up very quickly. Well, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt after church. We have hidden 200 Easter eggs around the perimeter of the church. Now, I've got two things to say. If you are a big kid, who, and by big kid, I mean you're faster and able to get to more, can you take care of our littlies? Make sure that they get enough. If one kid has 50 eggs and one kid has one, there might be some redistribution going on a bit later. The second thing I'd say, obviously parents watch out for your kids as they're running around the church. Second thing is, uh, if your kid is dairy-free, gluten-free, vegan, has allergies, come chat to me afterwards because I've got a secret stash just for you. Now, this will start as soon as Sam says the service has ended, <laughs> importantly. The service has not yet ended. <laughs> Just faked you out there, kids. Sorry about that. We are going to sing one more time. We're going to sing, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun. Would you please stand as we sing?
again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is pleasing in his sight and the blessing of God almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among you and remain with you always amen the service is finished Thank <laughs> you.